Hello, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode is an interview with Stefan Molyneux about his book, Everyday Anarchy. And the book is available for free online at freedomainradio.com forward slash free. We do discuss the book quite a lot in the interview, so I won't go into uh, any detail in the introduction. But just to say that um, the book is really about the fact that actually anarchy is something that we live uh, very much in our everyday lives and not only in the everyday life of voluntary interactions but also as a reality um, in the way that people interact with each other even within statism or governments and in the book uh, Stefan goes through a whole series of applications of, of this idea um, and you'll hear more about it in the discussion. So thanks so much for listening, and on to the discussion. Well, Steph, I was going to ask you a question, just, um, you know, while, maybe while people are thinking, what led you to write this one? Why did you, you know, why this book? Well, I wanted to write a book which would introduce people to the ambivalence that I think we all have with regards to voluntarism, even those of us who are supposed sort of out-and-out out, uh, anarchists, we, we have a challenge, I think, within our own hearts and within our own souls. Of course, I'd received a lot of comments over the years about my use of the word anarchy and people saying, well, you should use another word, you know, because it's, it's the word that's been owned by, you know, bad image, imagery and so on. And I didn't really like that too much because it seems ceding the territory to the enemy, so to speak, to say, well, we're not going to use this word, because it immediately looks like you're hiding something. So I wanted to do something to reclaim the word. So people didn't say, well, I'm a voluntarist, right? And you say, well, how is that different from anarchy? Because that's the first question people are going to ask who have any knowledge of things. And then you kind of forced to say, well, it's not. I just don't like to use that word. So immediately you're, you're seen to be sort of avoidant or a little bit weasley. So I wanted to write a book that did not have a lot of moral arguments for anarchy because I already did that in um, the everyday, sorry, I already did that in UPB. And of course I did that in the intro to philosophy series. So I'd already made the moral arguments and the logically consistent arguments. And what I wanted to do was just to get people to understand that anarchy is something we enormously treasure in our lives. And so we can't just automatically say that it's bad. I mean, you can't say something is bad if you would fight tooth and nail were it ever to be threatened to be taken away from you. And so I really wanted to write a book that was going to help people to understand that anarchy is not a weird out there perspective, but something that they live every day in their lives and that they actually live much more anarchy than they do statism when it comes to their day-to-day -day lives. So I really wanted people to understand that it is not a foreign concept. It's not you know, some crazy big bearded Russian lurking in the undergrowth with a timed bomb. Uh, it is actually something that people enormously treasure in their everyday life. And uh, so that's why I wanted to say this word is possible to reclaim it because we treasure it so much in how we actually live. And that really was the goal behind it. And I wanted to help people to understand that once you really get how a non-state enforced contract can work, and in fact, that the root of the state is a non-enforced contract. And actually, I just read something by Joe Biden the other day. And Joe Biden was saying about donators to political campaigns. He was saying, look, there's nothing that's ever written down where, you know, somebody gives you $100,000 uh, when you're running for office. Nothing is ever written down where they say, but I want access to you after the election. That's never written down. But it, that's how it really works. So when a guy who's given you $100,000 calls you up and says, listen, Joe, I need a little bit of your time, you just give him the time. That's just that's how it works. It's not even a handshake. It's just how the system works. And that, to me, was a really, really fascinating idea that uh, I didn't read this quote before I read the book, but it was fascinating to think that the entire foundation of statism was fundamentally unenforceable contracts or contracts which could not be enforced by the state. And that would actually be something that wouldn't be the case in anarchism. In, a, in anarchism or a voluntary society, you would have really enforceable contracts because you would have DROs and you would have exclusions and, and ex, uh, ostracism and so on. So I thought, well, what, what's the worst conceivable case for anarchism? Well, the worst conceivable case is contracts which simply cannot be enforced at all, at all. 
uh, any kind of contracts, right? So you basically would just shoot someone money and you'd hope that six or 12 months from now, they might feel like sending you an iPod and you could never sort of identify it by name and you could never enforce it or anything like that. Well, clearly people would say, well, if that was a system, it never would work. And then I thought, but that's, that's how it does work in the government. If people hand over hundreds of thousands or sometimes even millions of dollars to political candidates, nothing is ever written down. And then you just expect unenforceable favors months or sometimes even years down the road. No paperwork, no possibility of enforcement. Uh, and and that, that works. And that, if the worst case scenario in a government system, if the worst case scenario for anarchism works, then we can assume that uh, it, it would work a, a, a thousand or a million times better uh, in, uh, in a truly free society. So I felt that the state itself was an excellent proof of the lack of the necessity to have a state to enforce contracts because the state itself runs on non-state enforced quote contracts. Right. And I mean, there is that there's a long discussion in the in the beginning of the, the book about using the word and anarchy. And, you know, every chapter is sort of named anarchy and something. And so, you know, it was it was clear that you were really going for it in, in, in those terms. But presumably you obviously you did not self-identify as an anarchist for uh, well, up until, you know, a few years ago. And then after that, did you, was this something that you were thinking about for a long time in terms of sort of like reclaiming the word or, or like, cause how long have you actually called yourself an anarchist and used it like, as opposed to voluntarist or whatever? Well, I, I try not to call myself an anarchist because I think that is to label yourself according to a conclusion. Right. And the metaphor that I've used before is that Richard, Richard Dawkins wouldn't sort of have on his business card, hello, I'm Richard Dawkins, Darwinist, right? I mean, he wouldn't say that because Darwinism is a kind of conclusion to the scientific method. He would say, I'm a scientist or I'm a biologist, which is a process of evaluating. So I try to avoid identifying myself as the product of a series of arguments. I mean, that's why I like to call myself a philosopher, because the philosopher is, is a philosopher is somebody who uses reason and evidence from first principles and um, deals with immaterial things like, like ethics and, and honor and integrity and so on. And so I like to say I'm a philosopher. Anarchism is to philosophy as Darwinism is to biology. Uh, it is a, a conclusion that has arisen out of a methodology of the scientific method. Anarchism is a conclusion that arises out of the logical application of rational principles and scientific uh, and uh, historical empirical evidence. And so I try not to say I'm an anarchist because people perceive that like your left wing or your right wing or your Republican or Democrat which is a series of conclusions that is not really reasoned from first principles, but it's just kind of a position that people either swing into or inherit from their family or something like that. And so I didn't want to identify myself as somebody who holds a position, but rather that consistent reason and evidence results in anarchism, just as consistent application, uh, the consistent application of the scientific method results in uh, the theory of evolution or Darwinian evolution. And so um, that's why I've always tried to avoid calling myself an anarchist or refer to myself as a philosopher, because no conclusion is is as important as the methodology. Yeah, of course, actually, that's a really good point. I guess um, I, I totally see what you mean about referring to yourself about, as being an anarchist. But the book is does talk about, in a sense, reclaiming the word anarchism for just like as as the the voluntarist society, so to speak. So. Although uh, I t totally see what you mean about not referring to yourself or labeling yourself in that way. Um, there was clearly an idea here about, you know, reclaiming that word and using yeah, that Yeah, because you, you can't avoid the word. Because, I mean, I, you can't avoid the word. You can pretend to avoid the word and you can invent, you know, massive, serious flipper to gibbet if you want to describe your political preferences. But at some point, someone's going to say, what is the relationship between you, what you believe in anarchism? And you're either going to say... It's the same, but I don't like that other word, which seems kind of deceptive to begin with. Or you're going to come up with some convoluted thing about how yours is different from anarchism, which is only going to confuse people. So if people say, are you an anarchist? I say, you know, anarchism is a rational conclusion that I accept from the application of reason and evidence. And so you, could, you can certainly call me an anarchist and I would not be offended. Uh, it's just that I'm aware that a lot of people do that to try and pigeonhole you. So given that you can't avoid the word, um, so, for instance, um, uh, 
one of the problems that evolutionists have or, or that the biologists have is the problem of social Darwinism, right? So there's this thing that is put together largely by uh, religious people and creationists, uh, which is social Darwinism. In other words, because Darwin is about survival of the fittest and, and so on, people say, well, then if you're a Darwinist, you're into social Darwinism, which means that the poor should be allowed to starve and the sick should be allowed to expire coughing weekly of tuberculosis in the ghetto gutter and so on. And so you have to kind of make sure that when you say Darwinism, people don't think that you're referring to social Darwinism. So you have to do a little bit of work to reclaim the word from, you know, the word trolls who are consistently out there trying to baffle and confuse the debate by applying silly adjectives to intellectual ideas. And so I, I, you can't avoid the word. And I really wanted people to understand that they, they live in anarchy. They inhabit anarchy and they treasure anarchy. And my purpose, of course, is not by the end of the book, people say, anarchy, step back, I'll kiss it, I'll marry it, <laughs> I'll fundle it. But what I wanted them to sort of say was, anarchy is a complicated word. It's a complicated word. It's not like racism, which is just a negative word, you know, or anti-Semitism, which is just a negative word. It is a complicated word. It's like the word anger. Anger is a very complicated word, right? Because having no anger makes you a pushover and having an extremity of anger makes you, uh, you know, a sociopath or something, right? I wanted people to understand that, that anarchism to some degree falls into, at least it can be argued that to start off to understand anarchism, it falls into the Aristotelian mean, Right. Uh, and, and whenever something falls into the Aristotelian mean, like not too much, not too little, it's automatically complicated. And of course, people look at anarchism like it's just evil and, and chaotic and so on, although there have been some more positive references. Uh, there was a, an article recently that I read about free range childhood, which is childhood not overscheduled with endless amounts of, of parent driven activities. And somebody wrote about, you know, don't you remember the glorious anarchy of childhood when you could just sort of make up your own activities and free range around uh, the town and so on. But I really wanted people to understand that I don't believe that anarchy as a moral structure fits in the Aristotelian mean because it is just moral. But I wanted people to understand that you can't simply condemn something that you greatly treasure. And so there, there is at least ambivalence. And, and hopefully the book gives people the argument that there is ambivalence about the word and to just thoughtlessly condemn it rather than being curious about its complexity is, uh, I think, an immature response. Yeah, that was something that I really liked about um, the book was because for, like, the word anarchy in my mind had been, like, kind of just stuck in, like, an abstract political, like, ideal. Um, and then just having it see, like, that it's actually just, like, everything that you already prefer, like, where you have the option to, made it, like, such a stronger case um, for like the idea in general and just like um, freedom and stuff for me. And I really like that just seeing that it was everywhere and people who seem to like be so scared and hate anarchy and stuff like they actually really enjoy it. Like in most of the places that they can enjoy it. Right. And, and I think that's, I think that's right. And once people understand the degree to which non centrally planned, non coercive, free-range voluntary activities are absolutely essential to their life. Uh, they, they understand that they, they can't just simply dismiss it. I mean, it would be, I mean, they can, of course, if they're idiots, they can do whatever they want, but they can't be even remotely responsible intellectually and then just openly dismiss it. Because even someone like, um, let's say, some left-wing scientist, right? So some left-wing scientist says, the government must fund science, right? He'd say the government must fund science. So you'd say, well, of course, he's not an anarchist then, right? Because, because the government must fund science, right? But if you were to say the government must direct scientific research and the government committee will, will determine which is valid and invalid research and which scientific theories are true and false, this thinker would be appalled, Right. He would say, well, you can't have the government telling you what science is valid and what science isn't valid. He would be absolutely appalled. Of course, he imagines that by funding it, that isn't exactly what's happening to a large degree. But but nonetheless, so he would say, as a statist, I want government funding. But then he would say, as a scientist, the government should in no way interfere with the determination of good or bad or true or false science. 
And so even this person, who may be even a communist, he may be a complete statist, he still would be absolutely appalled if anarchic principles were not applied to the dissemination and judgment and peer review of good and bad science. Yeah, because like the like the state of anarchy, it, that's just like the natural state. Like, and anything else seems to be just like going off of the course. So you have to kind of fight to stay there. So even any of the um, like like communism, even if they're trying to say like they, you always end up with the contradictions because they're trying to go against the natural state, and it's just something that can't occur because then there's a reason why the natural state is the natural state. So You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And, and statism is, by its very definition, a violation of people's choices. Because if people would choose that which statists have ordered, then it would make no sense to have a state, right? I mean, if, if, if everybody wanted to fund some particular scientific endeavor, then that scientific endeavor would be, would be funded. And if everybody wanted the welfare state to be exactly as it is run by the government – then you would not need the overhead of the government because that's what would occur. Once the guns are taken away, that's what would occur. But status, of course, recognize deep down that the voluntary free choices of individuals would not produce the goals or the effects that they want. And so it is by definition a violation of what would otherwise occur in a, in a free society to have a state and to have status policies and that is um, something that, of course, people don't like to talk about very much. It's, it's the gun in the room. And so you're right. Anarchy is freedom, voluntarism, free choice. That is the natural state of human beings. And the state, of course, and state as policies automatically and by definition enter a distorting factor into that. It's like a massive gravity well that comes and distorts absolutely everything uh, around itself. And uh, so it is really a violation of that which is most natural and most uh, voluntary. Steph, I was wondering, what, what have you found the reception of this book to be like? Well, for the most part, the reception has been uh, non-existent, and that has been quite true of uh, many of, of the things that I have done. And, and what I mean by that is that uh, quite a large number of people read the book, and I will certainly get some emails saying, you know, great book, or I didn't like this, or, you know, but for the most part... Uh, it's um, it's dropping truth bombs down a bottomless well to <laughs> release this material into into the public. And when I was younger, and by that I mean <laughs> a couple of years ago, I thought that, I mean, this is an ironclad proof of the practical efficacy of anarchism. Like that, that the argument that I referred to earlier is is an ironclad proof about that that anarchism can work because the entire foundation of statism is the worst kind of anarchism that you could imagine, which is non-enforceable, non-public contracts, and it works really, really well. If it didn't work, there wouldn't be any such thing as lobbyists. And so it is an ironclad proof. And when you come across an ironclad proof of things in the way that I did with UPB, you jump up and down in your room. You're like, sweet mother of MC squared e equals MC squared. <laughs> I've done it, right? I've come up with the ironclad proof. And I particularly like self-contained Proofs, right? Proofs that you don't have to go and learn a lot about the intricacies of the Byzantine Empire uh, or tax codes or anything, but, but you can rely upon call, a common and general knowledge uh, of any reasonably educated or intelligent person. Everybody knows about lobbying and so on. So when you have a self contained argument that utterly proves the practical possibility of what you're talking about, and when you say to people who say that anarchism is impossible, when you remind them that the entire edifice of, of the state works upon the, the most mutated and bizarre form of anarchism, which would only be more efficacious were the state not resting upon it, then what you think is you think, oh, my good heavens, right? There's this silent thunder flash of thought around the world and everyone's going to get it and the arguments are going to be settled and statism is going to crumble and right you think you've come up with just this amazing amazing thunder flash firework display of proof and uh, unfortunately uh, or i guess you can't really say unfortunately since it's just another piece of evidence about reality that's uh, that's not what happens what happens is a lot of people consume the book and nobody talks about it i have an experience regarding the book uh, if, if it's all right please 
Uh, yeah, uh, I was saying in the chat room that this book was my first download for, for, from FDR. And I, I think I have maybe a little bit of insight on, on the, the non-response um, in that, uh, you know, as I looked at the book list, I looked at uh, things, uh, you know, like on truths and, uh, and some of the others. And I, and I looked at this as, hey, I'm here because I'm interested in politics, specifically anarchism. And as I, as I read the book, it was, um, it was right there that this was saying, hey, look at, uh, look at these principles as you apply them to your daily life. And, uh, you know, that uh, it, it was sort of a, a gateway for me since I was interested primarily in politics. And yet it was right there in the, uh, right there in the text about uh, don't, look at, don't look at politics, look at, uh, look at your daily life. And so I think that might be uh, a little too much um, too soon for a lot of people. You mean in terms of um, that they want principles to be applied like building railroad tracks between clouds, they want principles to be applied in very abstract realms, not in the mirror. Is that what you mean? Yeah, definitely. I, I think that, uh, uh, at least for me, it, it took me some time to get, uh, to, to break down that carp compartmentalized wall. And uh, uh, this book, you know, requires it um, as, as, as a proof. You know, it's saying, right. hey, look at these principles as you in your daily life which well and i think it also you know, I, think uh, I appreciate your response politics. i think that's quite right sorry to interrupt but i think it also uh, if you have an easy and effective proof of anarchism at your fingertips i think it's really hard to continue having the same kind of intellectual and political debates that you had in the past if that makes any sense definitely i think that was uh the uh the practical result for me anyway and uh, but I think it also explains why you get so many um, definite non responses of the book in that it uh, yeah the false self sees that and says, "Holy crap, shut the book you know <laughs> I, I, I do think I do think that people finish the book uh, I, I do think that people finish the book I think that it's it's just something that they finish. And it sort of exists like a sort of cyst in their mental bloodstream, like it's there, but it kind of gets sealed off and it kind of does not get connected to the rest of their thinking. Like, well, that was an interesting little curiosity. Uh, that was a fascinating argument or that was, you know, maybe it was well written or it was well argued, but then it just kind of goes off, you know, like a, like a bubble in the ocean. It just kind of bubbles off. Uh, and I don't think people then say, well, what are the consequences to, to the rest of, of my thinking, if that makes any sense? I, I agree. And just, just last night, in fact, I had a, was having an amazing, um, amazing talk at a meetup group I went to. And uh, I, I went through a lot of arguments, but, but not that one. Um, and you're right. That's, uh, it's somewhat odd. Well, and it's because it clinches it, right? It, it, it clinches it and it reveals something that has been revealed to me sort of slowly over the past few years, which we can get into later, perhaps, if people are interested. But if you, it's like the against me argument or the gun in the room argument. What it does is it brings the endless roundabouts of political debates to a screeching halt because it comes right down to fundamental principles. And people don't want to do that. They like manipulating the symbols and the metaphors and the fairy tales and the stories and the mythologies of political debate. You know, like it, the, basically I view most political debates like two little kids arguing whether Batman can beat Superman. Right? It's all just imaginary and you can sort of make up whatever rules you want, uh, but it's nothing real about it. Whereas the big arguments that I've put forward... Uh, you know, the gun in the room, the against me argument, the argument for morality, the, um, the everyday anarchy argument, and so on. They cut through all of that crap, and it, it, it gets right to the core very, very quickly. And I think people don't. They just don't want that. They really don't want that because they're involved in political arguments for some other reason than really determining. And also because I think they don't have a lot of respect for the people that they're arguing against. 
and they don't really want to see what happens if they bring an ironclad argument to bear? I'd like to ch to jump in if that's right. Yes. Um, I I'm um, I have become an FDR listener, and the first um, thing that I was doing was uh, listening to all the books, because I figured that maybe in the podcasts um, the ideas are not so worked out, and in the book uh, maybe it's all very laid out and very precise and and ripe, and so I, I read this, and. Then I didn't respond because, and and not not because um, I didn't get that it was right, but because uh, for me it was that I was uh, had been thinking about politics and the state of democracies or or, or um, societies uh, long uh, before I met um, um, I came across the book, mm. but uh, and I got that it was right, and I was really excited about it. But I did take some time to integrate it into my other thinking, that the point that you just made, it took really some time, uh, maybe over half a year. And during that time, I was talking uh, about the ideas of the book with uh, people in my life. But it was like, well, it seems true, but I, somehow I can't believe it. <laughs> It's so weird. It's so strange. It's so <laughs> right, right. Something's so wrong with it. So far away yeah. <laughs> from from all what I heard before, and all what I believed in before, that I can't trust it yet. And so I have I I, I, I had to go over the ideas maybe time and time again and think about it and and then listen to more podcasts and then slowly it began to sink in, it began to make sense. I, I went to arguments, I discussed with people and and then after a while I I relaxed into truth, <laughs> so to speak. Right. And so that was the reason in, in my case that I did I, I couldn't answer um just after finishing the book, although I, I was convinced that it was true. Yes, I agree with you. It's like you eat something and then it takes a certain amount of digestion to be able to really integrate it. Yeah, yeah. Especially, uh, I think, yeah. So if it's so much in opposition um, to all the propaganda and all the stuff that uh, one is usually taught and one usually believes, and I mean, uh, as you always say, <laughs> it uh, puts a strain, at least a strain, on the existing relationships. And I think that's yeah, it's hard to swallow. It is. It is very hard to follow. And of course, I've had the advantage of, of years of preparation in many ways. Uh, and so it is. It's definitely tough for people to, uh, to swallow that. Yeah. That's very good as well put. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, I wanted to reinforce the point uh, uh, um, uh, about the uh, taxation as force. I couldn't believe it, although I knew it was right. And so I looked it up in the, in the laws. And I didn't found it in the in the in the tax uh, law. Uh, I had to go to the police uh, uh, law, and then the uh, it doesn't matter. But I I really had to to convince myself that it was factually true. If, uh, I couldn't uh, in by reading um, the, the the text of the law, and then I saw it. <laughs> the police can take you <laughs> to to the courtroom or, or can help the I don't know the name, but um, yeah, it was really hard. Uh, I had to, to to convince myself by reading the law. Right, right. No, I think that's. Uh, I think that is quite right, uh, and it is a very, very trippy thing to think about. Sorry, were you saying that you had to convince yourself that if you don't pay tax, then the, the police will take you by force, or what was it that you had to convince yourself of? Yeah, that that the. Uh, um, I mean, um, taxation is force. That's very easy to see. That's that's. Take a min takes a minute, but I I wanted to see where the state actually states we are going to use force against you. Where, where is this written down? I had I had to find the place because I I somehow I thought maybe maybe they they don't do that. <laughs> so um, yeah, in the abstract sense, it's it's easy, it's it's clear. Of course, there has to be force, but uh, to really to really see it. I mean, I, I never uh, resisted the police, so I, you don't experience it. 
but I, I, I wanted to see actually the rules. When does the police come? Right, right. Yeah. And of course, they, they first they obtain a title. I think it's uh, that's a word. And then if you resist paying the title, then there comes a guy uh, who's trying to, to get the money. And if you let, don't let him in, then, then they, a judge uh, is issuing a permit to enter the, the house. And if you resist, then they break out, break, break, break the door. And I, but I had to read it. <laughs> and there it was. And that's just to say uh, how difficult it is to believe um, what you what you see, what you what you what you have inside in the abstract. I really believe that people are going to do this to you. It's that's it's quite a, a hurdle, I think. At least for me, it was. Right. Yeah. Although I suppose you know, I can understand because you can see that they do write down. We give ourselves the right to come and break your door down and so forth. But at the end of the day. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff they don't even bother writing down that they're just going to do anyway. You know, I mean, mm. the the uh, in a sense the the legal framework is um, is just the stuff that it's useful to have written down to get to end uh, to lend the air of, of legitimacy for people that that works for. But of course, there's all sorts of other stuff that they just don't bother writing down, and you would never find it in in uh, you know we we grant ourselves the right to do X Y Z because at the end of the day. It is, an, it, it is um, well, I don't want to use the word anarchic, but it, it is a, an, an arbitrary um, system of rule. Yeah, but um, I, I very much get the sense that, uh, at least in the Western states, uh, we don't have this, uh, wait, what, what, what do they call it? It's a, it's a, it's a system of law. And um, I, I very much believe that we have a, uh, a non-corrupt state, and uh, everyone, everybody's following the, the letter and the sense of the law, and maybe that's that was a bit naive, but still, there's a difference between, say, um, uh, England and um, Afghanistan or so. And um, I was uh, before um, I was proud of this uh, achievement that that at least um, uh, the state uh, and the bureaucrats were following the the rules. And I didn't look at the at the fact that they can make up any rule they want, but yeah, I was proud of that. And and then it's then it has more more force if you then see okay, that's actually the rule that they can draw the gun on you. Yeah, you mean even under their own terms, it's kind of under in, right in front of your nose that they're saying here we grant ourselves special rights to uh, to use violence against you. Yeah, uh, the entity that I was believe that that I believe that it was a good thing, because it it gives me some security of law and of of, of rights. They uh, turn against me if I um, hang on to my property. Right. Right. Okay. There, there's a, there's another layer of distinction to this though. It's not so much just that they do do that. It's that. The, the written law, quote unquote, is there to make you believe that it's right that they do that. As you were saying, Jake, we give ourselves the right. What they're saying is it's right for us to do this. It's good for us to do this. And at the beginning of the book, uh, Steph, you, you point that out immediately with the whole question of um, someone who would murder somebody in the morning and then help someone across the street in the afternoon, it, it gets right to the core uh, of what anarchy is really all about, and that's our understanding of morality, right? And I, I, think, I think in a lot of ways that that's what really scares people away from this book, is they get that. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, 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 most of my books are. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Somebody might just actually provide it, right? <laughs> oh, I really want meaning to my life. I really want to know the truth. I really want to know what what goodness and virtue is. I really want to know how to free the world. I really want to know how to have love and better relationships. It's like, okay, <laughs> strap yourself in because here's how it happens. And uh, people, um, uh, 
they they don't want they don't want the answers for the most part, or, or they don't want to share the answers with with others. They want to maybe the best that can be said is that they want the answers, but then they'll keep them very close to their own chest. Um, human beings for thousands of years, if you look at the most benevolent interpretation of religion, is that it is an attempt to find meaning and virtue in the world before philosophy. It's a pre-philosophical pursuit of virtue and uh, and uh, wisdom and meaning. That's the most generous view you can take of philosophy. Human beings have, invo- have been involved in this for over 10,000 years, trying to find the answers. This hunger for meaning and for virtue and truth has driven human beings. And yet, when it's provided, or let, let's just say some really great arguments that I think are pretty unassailable, but some really great arguments provided, everyone just sort of draws back in superstitious anxiety from those answers, which is a kind of weird thing when you think about it. It's like the guy in the desert, oh, uh, dying of water, or oh, thirst, all I want is water, for God's sake, let it rain, I'll lick my own sweat off my left kneecap just in order to survive, and then you give him a crate of Evian and he just sort of runs off. Ah, right? It's just a really strange thing to well, think it's about. A, it, it's, a double, it's a double bind, right? Because we're all, we're all desperately craving the truth, but we've all lived so long in a state of error that knowing the truth would bring with it um, some pretty significant personal consequences. And so... Um, that that state of ambivalence you, you were talking about isn't just around the word anarchy; it's around the word morality. Yeah, it's around truth. It really is. I mean, you're absolutely right. And it, yeah, it's it's not fundamental to everyday anarchy. That's just one more uh, example of it. And um, that's uh, it, it is really chilling the degree to which. But, but but we will we can at least say that human beings have progressed to the point where not many people will oppose your rational arguments with gods, right? So they won't say, Zeus tells me you're wrong. At least I don't really argue with many people like that. I come and run across them occasionally, you know, Jesus has informed me that you're incorrect. Um, but I don't really obviously debate with people like that who need more meds than philosophy. But um, uh, at least people put, and this has been really true since Thomas Aquinas, um, since the sort of late Middle Ages, people have really sunk their teeth into reason and evidence, reason and evidence, and even arguments for gods rely so often on reason and evidence, and even arguments against things like evolution. Um, supposedly, everybody says it's about reason and evidence, and even political arguments are supposed to be entirely devoted to reason and evidence. And so the problem, the, the short circuit occurs when you say, well, reason and evidence disprove your position and prove something which you find discomforting. Well, people can't then back away from reason and evidence. They can't overturn your argument. And yet they don't want to accept your conclusions. And so what you get is this massive short circuit. And, and that, I think, is why it's like dropping you know, truth candles down a well to put these kinds of works out there. Because what happens if your argument was just wrong, then you would just be, you know, people would write, back, write you back and say, oh, my God, this is really bad or this is a bad argument or whatever. And if you're, um, or if you, but uh, so because people can't argue against it and they can't let go of reason and evidence and they won't accept your conclusions, it just short circuits and they just kind of want it to go away. Because what, what this kind of philosophy does to people is it shines a light on the fact that they're only using the concepts of reason and evidence to support cultural prejudice. And they really don't like that. Because it's clearly, it's counterfeit currency, and it's, a, it's kind of a sleazy intellectual cowardice and criminality, in a sense, to do that. I'm not saying people are doing it all consciously or whatever, but, and this is true of, of so many of the arguments that I've put out there, and I'm sure it's true of other people who've put out really great arguments for things that people find tough to accept. But what happens is, I can't, I can't argue against the reasoning. The evidence is overwhelming for this argument. This is a self-contained argument that I can't even run to a specialist who will tell me that this is a misinterpretation of a certain historical perspective or whatever. And so people say, well, I either have to accept this conclusion or I have to reject that reason and evidence is the foundation for my conclusions, for my beliefs. And they don't want to do either. They don't want to accept the conclusion of anarchy or UPB or the gun in the room or or whatever it is that's being argued or even the RTR stuff. They don't want to accept those conclusions. But the only alternative, given that they can't overthrow the reason and evidence, is to reject reason and evidence, which means to retreat back to a conscious knowledge 
of cultural bigotry, that my, my beliefs are not reason and evidence, they're just cultural bigotry. And they don't like any of those. Like the door number three is to pretend that there is no door to number one and two. So I think that's all that people can, can handle at the moment. It is kind of a compliment, if, if that makes any sense. It's, it's a compliment in a weird way to the quality of the arguments. And, and, and why, do, why do you think that they can't handle it? Oh, well, that's a that's a big question, and I I don't want to get into why if if people have other things because that's that's a bit of a ways from everyday anarchy. I want to make sure we stay yeah. on the book club. So if people have other sure. things to say sure. about the book, uh, I'm happy to hear about that, or I can certainly talk about my answer at least to that question. What's the vote? Uh, answer to I this have, question. Or I have a question, if I may. Please. Steph, I was just curious. Um, we you mentioned at the beginning of the call, and and one of the things that I really enjoyed reading this book was sort of rec- you mentioned it was forty or fifty podcasts um, and essays sort of distilled. And one of the things I enjoyed uh, reading it was sort of spotting those little um, road signs that I had come across previously in distillations, or or I saw where they came from. And I was just curious what your experience writing, did you feel that the book came together very well because of all the groundwork you had already laid or what was your experience writing it like? Um, I must say that with the exception of a UPB, the books have been very easy to write. And I think you're right. It's because of all of that preparation, which goes back long before FDR to novel writing and and essay writing uh, in school and so on. But the, the books, uh, first of all, I, I try not to, I try to come up with new arguments in the books that, that aren't just a distillation of the podcast. Uh, I, I think that's, that's important for a number of reasons. And so I try to come up with new arguments, but you're right. There are things that are certainly mentioned before in the podcast, but the amount of preparation is so strong that to me, it's sort of, you know, like to, <laughs> a little bit of rank self-praise here, but you know, when you see a really good jazz musician uh, who's just kind of riffing, you know, just kind of jazzing along and, and improvising uh, it, it looks kind of effortless, right? And and it is only effortless to do that kind of improvisation when you have done an enormous amount of practice and preparation. And so for me, the writing of the books, I mean, it's shocking how a little time it takes to write most of those books. And um, uh, like I think On Truth was three or four days. And uh, but that that so it is kind of like just jazz, like because I, I just dictate it to the computer and and do do a little bit of editing and then publish. And um, uh, so it is, uh, it is a lot of preparation, but then the actual book writing is, is very, very easy. And that certainly was the case with Everyday Anarchy. I think it was five days or something like that. I mean, because it's, it's sort of all, all prepared in my head. Thank you. Sure. Hope that helped. I was going to say, you were mentioning, Steph, that um, the argument that you were most pleased with in this book was the, the proof of anarchy through political non non contracts so to speak or political right. like um deals and um I, I i think that's a great argument the thing that really stuck out for me in this in this book um was the uh, the it, it's more like um the I, I don't know how to describe it but an argument from the fact that you already do it which is basically to say that um just the point that you were making at the beginning is cool that everybody um, values anarchy and just by definition um, in their own life, they demonstrate that value because they would be horrified at the idea of being told who to marry or um, yeah, what job to have or what, what job to have. have. Yeah. And in a sense, that's a bit like the, um, the argument from, argumentation thing of like, you know, you, you must, you can't really refute um, ownership of, of your body because you're using it to make the argument. And, and, uh, in a sense, you know, you, the, anybody who, who uh, says anarchy would be disastrous is, um, self-refuting it just by the way that they live their lives and the expectations they have about using anarchy to, to, um, enjoy, uh, choices every day. And, um, and I think that in a sense is what the title for me is all about, you know, that, that, um, there's all these people wondering about living anarchically right now. It's just that there are certain weird special things that get given, uh, um, a different value, um, uh, you know, special relationships to the guy who calls himself, um, you know, a, a member of the state 
which uh, who gets attributed a special value, you know. I think that's right, and and I, I also was going to put it put into the book in, in the original plan, which I didn't end up putting in because I thought it was just a bit too um, too self referential. But but even the very act of debating, even the very act of putting forward an argument, is essentially an anti statist act, right? Because it is not using coercion, but rather persuasion to attempt to alter somebody else's behavior, which is a pacifist and voluntarist approach. So to argue for a state is to put forward a voluntary perspective or opinion that involuntarism is how things should get done. And that is fundamentally a self-detonating argument. To argue for coercion is is a self-detonating argument. And I thought that would just be a little bit too trippy to put into the book, so I didn't end up putting it into uh, into the final draft. But, um, but I think even the very act, not even living, but even the very act of arguing is to say that things should be decided according to reason, evidence, and voluntarism and not through force. And yet to argue for the state is to use anarchy, an anarchic approach, which is voluntarism and pacifism and reason and evidence. It's to use a philosophical approach, let's say, uh, to, um, to establish the validity of the opposite of philosophy, which is coercion. Right. If you're going to be a consistent statist, then you just never debate and you would just be shoving people out of the way all the time and, uh, and using violence in, in, in every circumstance, because that would be your, your true belief, so to speak. Well, you would say, I think if you were a consistent statist, you would say, I don't debate with people, I just get laws passed to get them to do what I think is right. Right, right. Like, I'm not even going to bother debating. Uh, if I think you're wrong, I'm going to uh, lobby the government to get you thrown in jail for disagreeing with me, but I'm not going to debate with you, that's silly, right? But they never do that, right? Yeah, yeah. And one thing um, that I found with the book, um, and this is, I mean, I, this is why I was curious about people who came to this first, and because I, I think there's a lot of arguments in here that are dealt with in the podcast, and in the podcast, each one of the arguments, in a sense, is like a whole podcast, when you're talking about, for example, the robber barons, or some of the other things. And for, for me, just, and this is maybe just a, a, a personal thing, I, I found that there was after the initial sort of framework that you set up about what what you mean by everyday anarchy and about the use of the word anarchy, that there's a lot of different things that kind of you go through quite quickly in the book. And I found myself a couple of times sort of thinking like, oh, what are we, now we're doing, oh, okay, now we're onto this and now we're onto something different. And it's quite a sort of, um, there's, a, there's a lot happening in this book, compressed into uh, into a very short space and and for me that that was sometimes maybe also you know when you listen on audio you have to really sort of if you're wandering around up, and yeah, yeah you've got to keep up right and um and i i guess w- was it your aim to to try and just sort of like cover because there's you know you go back into the historical stuff and you talk about the contradictions in modern democracy and and there's a lot going on what what were you trying to do by sort of putting all of that there well, the purpose of that approach it's the uh, it's the circle and snipe approach to dislodging somebody's certainties uh, it's 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 duck and weave you know it's like fly like a butterfly sting like a bee uh, and and the purpose of that is to recognize that when you're trying to dislodge somebody's cultural prejudices, uh, no single argument is going to work. Um, what, because the whole purpose is, is to, to dislodge someone's cultural prejudices or bigotries or whatever you want to say, to dislodge somebody's irrational beliefs. Uh, I've never found it helpful to just spear, you know, like try to spear a, uh, uh, a fly on the wall. I've never found it really useful or helpful to put my entire weight into sort of one spear check. What I do find helpful is to sort of ride around and uh, just, uh, you know, tap at the wall in, in particularly delicate places here and there. And if somebody is capable then of surmounting their own prejudices or their own false self, they will feel the structure begin to shake, recognize its instability, and then they will uh, take it from there. And so uh, early on in the book, I think I mentioned about how everybody who says, well, the guy who killed Ferdinand that sort of launched off World War I, he's called an anarchist, right? And that's considered to be really bad because, you know, he killed a member of the ruling class. 
but what about the 10 million people that the ruling class kills in return, right? How is it the anarchist gets a bad name because of one parasitical guy versus 10 million largely innocent, uh, mostly poor people who were killed on the battlefield? Uh, and now, uh, I, I don't sort of say, I, I don't sort of write a whole book or, or a whole chapter about that. That's just a little thing, right? That, that's just, it's just designed to make somebody go, huh, Right. And then we keep moving. Right. And we go to to another sort of instance. And all of these are just little pushes, little, you know, just designed to get people off balance, just designed to get them a little bit more receptive. But I try not to to drive the argument all the way home and say, well, here's all of the people who've been listed as anarchists. And here's what they did relative to what the response to them was. You know, the death count for the anarchists throughout history is 20 people. The death count for people responding to this anarchism is 100 million. And here's all of the, you know, I could go into all of that. But I find that if you continually drive into somebody's defenses, those defenses just harden. What you want to do is just kind of flit around and uh, just annoy them in a way or baffle or confuse them and sort of... It, it, it's sort of tough to take a test when there's a bee in the room, you know, <laughs> if you're allergic to bee stings or even if you're not. It's not that easy to concentrate. And so the purpose of the book was really to do a kind of just annoying and irritating dance, to be that sort of Socratic gadfly. Well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? So hopefully at the end of the book, somebody will at least say, you know, it's, there's, some, there's some good perspectives here. There's some interesting perspectives here. It's not as simple as I thought. I mean, that, that really was the goal of the book. Now, of course, that's why Practical Anarchy came later, which is uh, if people find themselves interested uh, or curious, then they can look at more of the sort of practical solutions. But the book is, is really just flitting around, dancing, ducking and weaving, pointing out things, shining a light here, shining a light there, then keep moving and so on, um, because I'm just trying to find out whether people are... Uh, are interested uh, or are able to overcome their perspectives. If they're not able to overcome their prejudices, then more proof will only make them hardened uh, and more resistant. And if they are, then they can move on to the next book. Right, right. I mean, that makes a lot of sense because there's another podcast from a long time ago that you did. I, I'm trying to remember exactly the words that you used, but basically you were saying that you were comparing, contrasting the fact that we live in a time where you have these, where humans have the capability to build these incredibly complex, uh, beautiful structures, you know, bridges and computer systems or whatever. And yet medieval thinking about certain things like, for example, morality and, and relationships and so forth. And in a way, what you're trying to do, I suppose, by launching all of those different arguments that the person is to find that bit of their defenses, which is is actually not the medieval end. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> that they're yeah. actually they're sort of the more enlightened part of the of the of their the brain that, that can take this in. Because everybody who, who's grown up in this world pretty much has some contradictions in their in their thinking about well morality and relationships and and politics and so forth. So. Yeah, it's a way. I suppose it's you, you, you're finding the uh, uh, finding the way in, right? And and I think that's a good way of putting it. Or to use a slightly more militaristic metaphor, uh, cultural prejudice is the U.S. military, and all we can be is insurgents, right? Insurgents never stand and fight. They just harass and pick, and you know they they cut fuel lines at night, and then they'll snipe someone, and then they'll. Um, I don't know. I have no idea why they lob some some grenades and then run away. But they never stand and fight because there's like 500 tanks coming down. <laughs> you're just going to lose. And so yeah. when you're going up against a real cultural prejudice, um, and statism is is one of the most core cultural prejudices. It's even stronger than religion. And, and more people deconvert from religion than from statism. And there certainly is a higher proportion of atheists and anarchists in society. So statism is much much stronger than than religion. And it is such a strong and, and embedded and powerful and, and omni-reinforced by every conceivable piece of media that to stand against it, you're just going to get run over. You, just, you have to harass and just have to pick at it until it just gets, gets weary and you know, like it rolls over or something. But uh, you, you, you just you can't stand against it. Now, you see, that uh, I, I think that's a great metaphor and, and makes a huge amount of sense, but just... Um, you know, for the sake of argument, how do you see that fitting in with the 
the other approach, which in which is embodied in this book, which is you say, you know what, I'll have that word anarchy. Yeah, well, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna say, well, you know, it's voluntarism. It's like this, that, and the because that would, in a sense, taking anarchy is really like saying, fuck it, let's just go for it. Let's call it by what it is. And that, in a sense, is a much more in-your-face approach to people's defenses about this word. And that's, that's true. That is true. That is true. I'm trying to think if that, uh, if that makes any sense or whether my metaphor is, uh, is misplaced. I think, you know what I, th- I think it is? It's not, it, it, you, don't, you still don't surrender your ammo if you're an insurgent, right? I mean, and I think that we want to hang on to that ammo. And uh, I also believe, of course, that in any conflict, and this comes straight out of Rand, of course, but in any conflict, the most consistent position will always win. And if you dodge the word that most accurately describes your political perspective, first off, then you automatically are inconsistent. And the only way that you can beat a monolith like statism is through a real, really uh, rigorous consistency and that just sort of insurgent, darting in, darting out, go for whole stuff. But I, I think that that consistency is really key. Without the consistency, you can't win at all. Because, of course, cultural prejudice is by its very nature a monolith of inconsistency, and you can't fight inconsistency with inconsistency. And so I think that we do need that consistency in order to win. But, again, I still don't think that, at least with that book, which is designed as an intro, uh, with that book you really can't uh, – you just can't square off directly against it because people will just uh, – they just fall back into the just, – you, know, you just can't win. Right, right. Yeah, I do see what you mean. Basically, given the cultural prejudice and the and the strength of it, the the fact that the it, it, the, the arguments are consistent is the is the real weapon uh, that we've got. Right, right, and and too much, but but too much pile driving consistency just causes people to scatter. Uh, it just causes their defense. They, in a sense, they, their false self calls for backup, and you just don't get any further, right? Um, so it is, a, it is a real challenge that way. And that really was the book was uh, just a, sort of like a buzzy bee in the room, just to, in a sense designed to throw people slightly off balance and say, well, yeah, I guess it's true that I do like anarchy here, and I guess it is true that there seems to be a prejudice against it. And, at the end, and wow, that is interesting that the state rests on anarchy and so on, right? None of those are total clinchers. Uh, and of course, I don't think there is such a thing as a total clincher in many ways, but uh, that is really just designed to to get people to, you know, is, is, can you can you get one question mark out of the smooth black obsidian surface of cultural prejudice? If you can extract one question mark out of that, then that's uh, you know, it's a it's a huge uh, it's a huge step forward. Well, uh, going back to the metaphor for a moment. Um, it, 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 the, you could see the book as kind of like a, a, a two-pronged approach then, right? Go full frontal on the word so that you get the, you get the surface personality focused on the definition of the word, right? And then that frees up room on the flanks to come in with uh, um, the, um, the insurgency arguments, right? Yeah, that could be a way of putting it too, yeah. You know, we could definitely get really nerdy now and say, start going into, you know, detailed military metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, think... the argument is a bit like, you know, that, that, like having a, a rocket launched uh, an RPG, you see, and the other guy. <laughs> right, right, right. Bring up UPB on the left flank. <laughs> dive, dive. It's like Washington at Valley Forge. Yeah, so it's it's just it's a kind of teaser. It's a teaser book just designed to get people who are capable of it to to be thrown off balance and ask a question or two. You, you, Steph, you've s- said with some of your other books that you just hated the experience of of writing them um, because you know it was quite a um, painful process. What was this one like? Oh, it was great. No, this was great. Uh, I, I, the only two that I really disliked were UPB and and some aspects of of Practical Anarchy. Uh, I mean, UPB was just like pulling me out, spleen out through my nose. But um, uh, the the other ones have, have been relatively easy. RTR was was fairly easy. That was just a couple of weeks. And um, uh, these uh, the, this one was very easy. I mean, the, sh- the shorter ones, the more conversational ones uh, are are easy and a great deal of pleasure. For the most part, even with with the books, um, it's the first draft I, I enjoy. The second and third draft uh, it starts to become a bit tedious the fourth and fifth draft plus then all the stupid formatting for the print book plus then having to spend two or three days reading the audiobook by that time you just you know no matter how much you might like your own writing you're 
still a little sick, you know, like Sting singing Roxanne for the 12 millionth time, right? So um, I really, I've almost always really enjoyed the initial process of writing because that's where the brain is really lighting up. But like most things in life, it's like 10% inspiration and, and then 90% just a, a lot of boring technical stuff to get it out. That just seems to be the, the case. Right. Have you got any plans to do anything further with this book? I mean, is it basically, how do you see these? You put them out and you've got, obviously you've got the audio, they're there and they're, you know, the books, many of them have been done in, in response to specific kind of debates that have happened on the board and stuff. Is that, is that it? Or do you, you know, do you plan? Cause I know you, for example, you were thinking about revisiting real time relationships and you're going to take out some, some of the references to, to the political stuff that was less maybe less relevant i just wondered is there any do you ever think about doing anything further with this book or is is that no i don't and and the the reason for that is the books while they you know i can certainly not claim that they've revolution revolutionized human thought in general in any way shape or form what the books have done jake is and and really this was the major purpose behind the books what the books have done is that they have allowed us to move on from particular debates as a community. And that to me, like, oh man, I mean, remember before UPB came out, I mean, like half the board posts were about UPB and it was yeah. a big, complicated, challenging, ugly quagmire mess because that's what UPB is, right? Not because it's so tough, but just because it's so counter to our programming, right? And uh, that to me, uh, it was the major reason for uh, for writing the books was because people had i mean some were trolley but but most of them i think were just legit legitimate and valid confusions about the theory of, of upb or whatever and it became such a quagmire like oh there'd be like 12 million board posts then i do a podcast and then i'd write a, an article and then i do another podcast and another board post and of course in the, in, on the board it says it's really tough because you'd get lots of people chiming in who weren't that familiar with the theory and um, it, things would go awry and astray and, and so on, right? And so the purpose of a lot of the books has been to help people to, to, to get past particular phases of a debate. I mean, the nice thing is that we really don't deal much with UPB anymore, right? I mean, when was the last time a real UPB question came up? Well, every now and then people would come up with, you know, how does UPB apply to tetsy flies attacking tiger sharks or whatever? And we'll sort of take a swing at that. But I think most people are competent to, to do those kinds of things by now. But we really haven't gotten into a UPB because the great thing about having the books is, is, is it's a way of finding out whether somebody is a troll or is genuinely serious and interested in the question, right? Because, and that's the other beautiful thing about the books being free, right? So... If somebody says, I don't, you know, anarchy can't build the roads. Well, before, it would be the same damn thing over and over again. And all the newbies would pile in. and Maybe they would give answers that weren't very good. So the more experienced people would have to come in and, and pull that apart and clarify it and so on. But if somebody is genuinely interested in some good arguments as to how anarchy might work or whether anarchy is, is a practical value, you can say, I, you say, I don't think anarchy will ever work. It's like, well, here's a three-hour book that is, is an argument as to why it does and is all around you. And if somebody is not interested in listening to that three-hour book, then clearly, if that's free, then clearly they're just a troll, right? They're just coming in because they're anxious or they're aggressive or they're just, you know, general internet dickishness, right? And so that's the great thing with the books is that they really do help weed out the sort of uh, the wheat from the chaff. And that's been true of, of most of the books that have come out um, and so that to me has been the real value is it has allowed us to move on. It's why I did that final debate on determinism and then just said, fuck it, we're done, right? Because, uh, that, that holds every piece of perspective that I have and it just doesn't have to be piecemeal. And you can say to somebody, have a look at this. And if I've made mistakes, please tell me where they are. And then people, they never come back. They never come back from that. Uh, and so I, it, it has been hugely valuable and just decluttering all the people who were coming in to just make noise and cause trouble, so to speak. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I had a question about the uh, freeness of the books. The which? Um, the fact that they're free. Oh, yes. Um, I was just wondering what um, uh, sort of your... Uh, your feeling is, uh, or, or your experience is, relative to 
um, previous attempts at getting published, like how, how do you feel in terms of your success at getting these books um, published and distributed compared to prior prior stuff like the like the fiction and that sort of thing? Uh, like, are you, are you happy with the with the um, with the free model, or would you? I mean, even sort of setting aside the the pro, the problematic content. Um, I mean, in terms of the popularity of the subject matter, but um, w do you see yourself trying any other other means of getting these books out, or is the free? The oh free no, no, the no! I, the free mode is is the way to go. I uh, I must I must compliment all the publishers who rejected me over the years. I mean, I mean, I really must uh, because they knew their business a lot better than I did. I mean, they were absolutely right. They were absolutely right. It would have been a disaster for um, for any publisher to attempt to publish what it is that I'm doing. Uh, and so I'm very glad to have gone the free route, and I certainly have no complaints whatsoever about the publishers who rejected me because uh, it makes sense. It, it makes perfect sense. I mean, lots of people download and listen to these books, but uh, in terms of, you know, I mean, I've, I've, I mean, I've asked people, you know, drop me a few bucks for the books if you like them and so on, and very few people do. And uh, what that means is that um, although people find the books fascinating to download and to listen to, and, and they do not uh, find them to be full of errors, I guess a few trolls have found them to be full of, quote, errors, but um, the arguments are strong and solid and have sustained themselves now. Again, it's been a couple of years since the first books came out, and uh, the arguments have held up, I think, magnificently. But no, I mean, uh, clearly, <laughs> I mean, the market value of philosophy is very low. I mean, the market value of philosophy is astoundingly low. I mean, this is the largest and most successful philosophical conversation that has ever occurred throughout history, right? Again, largely because of the, of the technology. And in general, uh, you know, you can, I'm, I guess I'm sort of approaching half of what I used to make in, <laughs> in the software field after a couple of years of brain-busting, uh, knuckle-blistering effort. Uh, and this is so fr free distribution around the world would give you a sense of how much value there is or how much genuine, real economic value people place on philosophy. And I'm certainly not complaining and saying I'm, you know, slowly expiring on my last tuberculotic sandwich or something. But compared to, say, your average middling golf star, uh, it's it's a completely pathetic and ridiculous income, let alone, you know, people like Tiger Woods who can knock a ball into a hole. And so I'm very happy with the free model because philosophy is something that everybody talks about. But when you actually try to put economic traction on the value of it, it is, um, it is, not, uh, it is, it is almost not there. Uh, I am, I mean, it, it really depends on how you measure it. But uh, certainly in terms of, uh, you know, downloads, general views and penetration, uh, I'm one of the most influential philosophers in the world today. And... Yet it's, it's really hard to, to get, I mean, certainly you can't, you can't get rich of it, even with a massive worldwide free distribution network. And even with all of the, you know, I guess not inconsiderable charm and, and humor and songs and silliness and engaging um, conversations and so on that are in the podcast, even with a, a high quality delivery and um, uh, free access and so on, the economic model is astounding. Like even with all of this free distribution around the world, it's barely a middle class income that can come kicking out of it. And that is just an economic reality of the situation. So, I mean, to have to have invested in print books for a publisher and have to have done marketing and advertising campaigns and paid the cost to deliver those books and sent me on book tours and so on. I mean, a publisher would have just ended up eating their own shorts and three toenails of their neighbors if anyone had tried to back me from a traditional publishing standpoint. So, you know, kudos to them. They were, they were absolutely right. Uh, hey, Steph, could I uh, throw you a question? Ah, yeah, please. Uh, so first, uh, I mean, going back to the aptness of this sort of guerrilla warfare metaphor that you raised, I just wanted to give you the feedback that I think you certainly... Uh, like brilliantly struck a balance when it comes to floating like a bee and uh, sting like a sorry floating like a butterfly. <laughs> <sing> like a, <laughs> sorry. So you know, we geeks are not very good at sports or at military <laughs> metaphors. But anyway, go on. 
So, so what I what I think, um, at least my uh, experience in reading the book was that you you're floating around, dancing around, and uh, you know you have this wonderfully playful kind of um, uh, you know light deprecation of yourself, and uh, you know playfulness and joking all throughout the book, and it. it it seemed like in the almost the last chapter uh, or the last uh, the last page almost it's like where the the rubber really met the road like you even talk about um like truth at all costs right and it uh, the impression i get um is like like you mentioned like you're riding around and you're you're gently tapping this this fortress sort of um like the socratic gadfly and then at the end you it's not like you go in charging for the for the coup de gras. It's more like you uh, you have this rallying cry at the end, which I think was fantastic. It's almost like a like a come hither stare, like um, <laughs> kind of like um, so so yeah. Like uh, I, I guess what what my question is, what was the intended impact you wanted that to have? Did you did you think this was going to win over the reader um, in the space of reading this book? Or was it more like um, was it more like the um, kind of venomous snake, kind of like stab your victim and wait for it to uh, <laughs> to weaken and die before you before he reeled in to FDR? Was we're, it, we're back to the worst metaphor. book reviews <laughs> ever. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> venomous snake. It's an, it's an Iraqi <laughs> surgeon. It's like things that will not be going on the back cover. Anyway, um, Tom and I. Well, can- Writing out lists here of... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's like a black adder in my pants. Um, <laughs> no, that's a, that's a great question. I would say that by the time somebody's gotten to the end, I know that the structure is shaky. I mean, obviously, right? Because otherwise they would have left the book alone, right? They would have put the book down earlier. Right? So if, if somebody has gotten to the end, then I know that the walls are trembling, Right? And so a well-placed blow should bring them down. That, that's the, and that was the idea behind On Truth as well, right? Because there's quite a passionate bit at the end of On Truth as well. And um, uh, so, yes, you're absolutely right. The, the beginning of the book is, you know, it's, it's jokey and it's more like, hmm, isn't it interesting that? And have you ever noticed that? You know, it's like the worst, most philosophical stand-up in the world, right? But then once somebody's gotten to the end, then, I mean, there's two things that I want to do. Is that one, I want to say, this shit is really important. It is, is really important. Like all joking aside, this book, this, this, this idea of voluntarism is really important because it does come down to questions of war and prison and how we raise our children and so on. So that was one aspect. And the other is that I want them to continue. I want them to read something else. I want to get them to the next book, to the next podcast, or, you know, whatever, to, to, to some other, someone else who's writing about it. It doesn't matter if it's mine or not fundamentally, as long as they're still in pursuit of knowledge. So by the time someone gets to the end of the book, I really do, I know that they've hung in there, that they've kept going, and that, um, uh, you know, one blow should bring it down. Now, whether that has worked or not is, you know, remains open to be seen. Um, I'm still of two minds about whether that is a good idea or not a good idea, because, again, I don't know whether this is the best that can possibly be achieved, given my skills and the the free technology that's available and the generosity of supporters and donators that makes it all possible. I don't know if it's the best that can be achieved or if there's some other approach that can, that could be better. I, I, I genuinely think or generally think that it's the best that can be achieved, but I'm certainly open to arguments to the contrary. Right. That's fantastic. I mean, I, I just want to commend you really on doing that. that I think that's fantastic. The, you put in that that dense, that compact, concise, uh, like just it, I experienced it as, as word perfect. Just it was it was a very stirring experience to read that last section. What was your just that of interest when you read this one? Uh, how much had you been, had you been involved for a long time before? Or? Oh yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah. So so I was very familiar with the arguments, but the. I guess, I guess the the key one, the um, you know the, what you brought up before, the um, sort of like you can't you can't argue for so you can't argue against anarchy without uh, without relying on the validity of anarchy. You can't support the government without arguing for anarchic principles because that's what it rests on. Like it's it's such a powerful argument that 
it was very it was a very empowering read if that makes sense and i i don't think i'm alone in that i think that was a very um like it it, it puts power back on the it puts anarchists on the offensive uh which is what i i really liked about this book which um which is uh why i bought two of them <laughs> to, to share <laughs> I also remember that final section, and uh, I remember it is a real barnstorm at the, the end mm-hmm. of the book. It's mm-hmm. great. All right. Do we have any other questions or comments, Greg? I haven't forgotten about your uh, your question, but perhaps we can uh, we can convene another time for that because it's a big one, which is the little... yeah. And it's why is there such time. resistance to people unmasking of their motivations for political arguments? I think that's really a great topic. It's the bomb in the brain, part five, I think, which is I'm still sort of doing some research on and trying to get an interview or two for. So um, those are, it's an excellent question, but uh, I just wanted to uh, say we should reconvene for that. Sure, sure. It's, it's more content than, um, than, than form here anyway, so it doesn't really apply. Uh, no, I think it's important because it does come back as to, to why the books are so consumed and so untalked about. It's, uh, uh, and and in that's, that, that's the precedent for that, of course, is, is Ayn Rand, right, that, that so many people talk about Ayn Rand, so many people read Ayn Rand, but very few people talk about her, right? She doesn't show up in the media. She doesn't show up in classrooms. She doesn't show up at dinner tables. Uh, Ayn Rand is the guilty secret for a lot of people. And uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be in that uh, slutty downtown mistress category. It's, uh, yeah. it's, where the, uh, it's where the really innovative thoughts are, I think. Yeah, it's one of those, she's one of those authors. In fact, you're one of those authors where people... people uh, the, the, in social circles, they have to say, oh, yes, I've read him, but th- they can't actually agree with you. They're yeah, or out. disagree. They just have to, you know, it's the, uh, with Ayn Rand, it's just all argument from from adjective, right? Uh, right. I find her philosophy cold. I, I find her use of logic too light blue for my taste. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to give feedback on uh, on the uh, effect the book had on me. I, I already told some, but now that I know what uh, you had in mind writing the book, that it was um, not a, uh, a head-on uh, um, strike to the defenses, and that it was um, it was a uh, how do I say this a rising tension until the end. I right. think. It worked with me very well, as I said in the first um, after the first listening. It was uh, that was uh, um, about uh, one and a half years ago. That was very challenging, and I had to digest it. But for this book club discussion, I listened to it again, and um, in the time in between, I listened to very much uh, podcasts and. Uh, was involved in discussions and uh, participated on FDR. So I'm, I'm very familiar. I have become very familiar with all the arguments. And to me, it was almost boring to re-listen to it again. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I agree with me. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you wouldn't want to go back and do your grade four mathematics <laughs> book over yeah. again, right? So I, I, I can I can really say uh, that that would be a measurement for uh, that it's really an introductory book. And that it does its work, <laughs> at, least, at least with me it, it did. And uh, then after a while uh, you digest it and then, well, it's just an easy, easy read. It's, it's still very pleasant to, to read it because the, the arguments are so, so nicely put and, and so consistent. And it's, it's, it's also pleasurable uh, um, uh, language you use. And uh, yeah, so I think uh, you uh, accomplished uh, what you um, tried to do with the book. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. And I say, you know, you can't start off a book called Everyday Anarchy by saying, you know, anarchy is great and everybody who disagrees with it is addicted to violence. I mean, people just won't read it. Um, so I appreciate that uh, that it, uh, that sort of teasing, uh, banal, gentle curiosity thing sort of worked and, and uh, I'm glad that it did. Yeah, yeah I did. We're going to- yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Let's try and keep the book review long, shorter than the actual book itself. Um, <laughs> I think that's very important. But thanks, everyone. I really do appreciate your feedback. And uh, it is uh, nice to know what worked and, and what can be improved. Thanks so much for taking part. Okay, bye. Bye. Fantastic. All right. Well, in which case, I think we're going to sign off from, uh, from England. So thank you so much. It's been great fun. And look forward to uh, seeing you at the next one. All right. Take care. All thanks right. a lot, Jake.
Thank you, Jake. Good night. Thanks. Bye. Bye.